So let's begin the physiology of blood vessels and circulation. Uh, as usual, physiology can be the more difficult portion of this course, and I always recommend to break it down into smaller, manageable topics. Um, there's a lot of concepts in this chapter that are extremely important to understand uh, moving forward in a medical uh, career. Um, we're going to kind of start with some of the basic um, ideas and then hopefully build upon that as we go through these next few videos. Uh, so let's start with the four most important vital signs a uh, medical professional needs to be able to determine. Uh, the first one is a pulse or heart rate, and that's pretty straightforward. Uh, you, they're going to use certain pulse points throughout the body. Um, a pulse point is an area where an artery is fairly superficial, so you can palpate it or feel it. And that artery needs to be an elastic artery where you can feel the stretch and recoil uh, that occurs uh, each beat of the heart. Uh, normal range of a resting heart rate is anywhere between 60 to 100. Um, again, uh, the more physically fit someone might be, the lower. Um, maybe if they're less physically fit, it might be at the higher end. But this is typically what we think of as a normal resting heart rate. Blood pressure, that's a big topic uh, for this chapter. Um, the kind of normal blood pressure numbers we throw out a lot of times are 120 over 80, uh, and that's given in millimeters mercury. Um, we're going to learn how that's done. So that's done using a stethoscope and one of these blood pressure cuffs in order to determine what the pressure is when the ventricles are contracted which is systolic blood pressure, and then what is the pressure when the ventricle is relaxed. And this is systemic blood pressure, not pulmonary blood pressure. Respiratory rate's another important measurement or sign, uh, 12 to 18 breaths per minute, and that can really be done pretty easily just by uh, watching the chest uh, expand and recoil on every breath. And then finally, body temperature, we all know, is an important vital sign, um, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and 37 degrees Celsius. And again, there's a range here, plus or minus a couple degrees, and there's a range here. It can be a little lower, it could be a little higher, but uh, these are usually the numbers that are given for these normal vital signs. Okay, so let's just review the pulse points. Uh, superficial temporal artery can be felt pretty easily. Uh, you could do the facial artery, carotid artery, um, radial artery is probably the most common. You could do the femoral artery uh, near the groin area. Uh, you could go behind the knee, uh, on top of the foot, so on and so forth. So those are your most common uh, pulse points. Okay, so how do we take blood pressure? So you'll get a chance to do this, I'm sure, uh, if you move on to a medical program. Um, but I want you to understand the concept um, because once you understand the concept, things are, are much easier um, to understand. Uh, first thing I want to remind you is you're not listening to the heartbeat. You're not listening to valves. Uh, you're actually listening to blood kind of squirting through the artery. Okay, So you're going to use a pressure cuff. You're going to use a stethoscope. Okay, and the idea here is the cuff, when you pump the pressure up, it's going to close off the brachial artery. Okay, so a couple things to remember. When blood is flowing freely through an artery, when it's fully open, it doesn't make any sound. All right, there's no swishing sound. Uh, when an artery is closed off, all right, if you were to occlude or compress an artery, it also isn't going to make any sound because there's no blood flowing through it. But what makes sounds is when that artery opens up again. All right, so what happens is we pump the pressure up. You got to get the pressure above systolic blood pressure. All right, because you got to make sure it closes that artery. Right, if the cuff, the pressure in the cuff is greater than systolic blood pressure, it'll collapse the artery. 
Okay, so notice this first picture, these are kind of cross sections of the brachial artery. When you pump that pressure up well above their systolic blood pressure, so you got to get up to, you know, 160, 170 to make sure you've closed that artery. All right, so you have the pressure in the cuff, you know, above systolic uh, blood pressure. And if you listen to that, blood, that artery, so you got to know where to place the stethoscope, you won't hear any sound, all right, because there's no blood flowing through the artery. As you release the pressure, all right, so the pressure starts to drop, drop, drop. The moment the pressure in the cuff equals the highest pressure in the artery, that artery is going to start to open up, all right? So notice now we've got a little bit of opening in that artery. And you're going to start to hear the blood squirting through that artery, basically a swishing sound. That sound is called the Karatkov sounds. So you'll hear the blood swishing through that artery. And you'll keep hearing it, all right, as that artery opens up more and more. Then the moment the pressure in the cuff equals diastolic pressure, those sounds go away. All right. So the idea here is you don't hear anything if the artery is completely closed. You don't hear anything when the artery is completely open again. But you do hear blood flowing through a compressed artery. So the moment you start to hear the sounds, it's systolic. The moment they go away, it's diastolic. All right. This is a graph representation of this. So the red line represents blood pressure. So here's systolic blood pressure, the highest pressure. Here's diastolic. The blue line is the pressure in the cuff. So you've pumped the pressure up, all right, to say 150 or so. As the pressure drops, right, once it reaches systolic pressure, so the pressure in the cuff equals the highest pressure in the artery, you start to hear the first Karatkov sounds. As you release the pressure, once it equals diastolic, those sounds go away. All right? So the first time you hear the sounds is systolic. The last time you hear the sounds is diastolic. All right? So I want you to know the concept. Um, when you one day have to learn how to do this, um, you can apply the concept to the procedure, and hopefully it makes much more sense for you. All right? Okay. Uh, these are some topics in physiology uh, we're going to touch on. So first thing, blood flow. What is blood flow? Well, that's a volume flowing through a tissue per minute. All right. So you blood flow through the heart, blood flow through an organ. Um, that's just how much blood is flowing through per unit of time. The biggest concept we're going to learn in this chapter is blood pressure. So blood pressure is a pressure gradient. All right, so that what that means is blood needs to move from where it's under a high pressure to where it's a lower pressure. So the heart produces the pressure, and as that blood flows away from the heart, that pressure is going to start to drop. Um, in arteries, the pressure fluctuates, so you're going to get that higher systolic pressure and then that lower diastolic pressure. Once you get to the smaller blood vessels, like the smaller arterioles and the capillaries, it doesn't fluctuate anymore. It doesn't go up and down. But it consistently drops because wherever you're moving the blood next has to be lower pressure. So the highest pressure we're going to see is in the left ventricle and the aorta. The lowest pressure is going to be in the right atrium because that's your final destination uh, when we're studying the systemic circuit. We're going to talk about what regulates your blood pressure. So how does the nervous system regulate it? Are there any hormones that influence blood pressure? Uh, we'll touch on speed a little bit. So blood velocity, um, that's given in milliliters per second. It's inversely related to cross-sectional area. So what does that mean? It means when blood enters a bigger area, it slows down. All right, And the largest area is in your capillaries. Now, you might say, well, how could the capillaries be bigger than, say, the aorta? Well, an individual capillary is not bigger, but if you were to add them all together, there's much more area in all the capillaries than there is in just one aorta. 
All right, so blood actually slows down in the capillaries, all right, and then it kind of speeds back up again, going back to the heart. Peripheral or vascular resistance, that's the opposition to blood flow, all right, due to friction. Uh, the more opposition there is, the higher the pressure has to be. So if there's anything that affects resistance, uh, maybe you have atherosclerosis in your arteries, or maybe you have thicker blood because you have too much red blood cells, that can cause a, a higher resistance and can lead to higher pressure. So viscosity or thickness of blood increases resistance. Um, blood vessel length. The farther you got to move blood, the more resistance there is. So one concept we're going to get to is obesity. Well, when someone is obese, they have more blood vessels uh, to supply all that um, adipose tissue. So because of that extra tissue, blood has to move farther, and that's going to increase pressure. So obesity is one factor that causes hypertension. And then diameter. This is a very important concept. Uh, diameter is inversely related to pressure. So when you increase the diameter of blood vessels, the pressure goes down. Um, if you decrease diameter, we call that vasoconstriction, that's going to increase resistance and blood pressure. All right, so the body can do this naturally. So for example, if for some reason you have a drop in blood pressure, uh, one way your body can keep that pressure up is constricting the blood vessels. And then it can do the opposite. If your blood pressure go, is really high, um, we could dilate our blood vessels to bring that pressure down. Uh, we'll talk about capillary exchange. So these are mechanisms that exchange molecules between your blood and your tissue. So how do things exit the blood? How do things enter your blood at capillaries? And then another thing we'll talk about is called venous return. This is the flow of the deoxygenated blood in your systemic veins uh, going back to the right atrium. And that's important because we don't want pooling of blood in our venous circulation. Uh, that can happen quite often in elderly individuals or people with poor circulation. Okay, so let's talk about blood pressure. Some few, a few basic definitions here to begin with. Systolic blood pressure is the pressure exerted when the ventricles are contracted. Now we're talking about systemic here, so it would be the left ventricle. So when that left ventricle is in systole, right, contraction, whatever pressure that is, that's called systolic pressure. When the ventricle relaxes and is in diastole, that's diastolic pressure. Just so happens we measure this typically at the brachial artery because you can't get in there and, you know, test the ventricle. Um, the good news is the pressure in a, in a major artery like the brachial artery is pretty close to what the ventricle is doing. So we can assume that if your blood pressure in your brachial artery is, say, 120 over 80, then that's what your ventricle is. Um, this, these are some of the categories, so again, we've probably all heard the 120 over 80, that would be considered normal, um, one, you know, any systemic blood pressure up to say 129, or, and um, over 80 would be considered slightly elevated, um, hypertension stage 1 is even greater systolic, and now you're getting a little increase in the diastolic so on and so forth. So the goal is to be here, 120 over 80. Um, the higher and higher it gets, uh, the worse and worse your hypertension is. Uh, the good news is there are things that you can do uh, to treat or prevent hypertension. There's a lot of things that can be done. Um, and that's because there's a lot of things that might influence and cause that high or hypertension. Okay, so what what are you know, some of the causes of this. So hypotension is low blood pressure. Um, this can be associated with pretty good health. So it's better to be a little bit hypotensive than, you know, hypertensive. But some people can develop it uh, when going from a sitting uh, 
position uh, and standing up. So that's called orthostatic hypotension, a temporary drop in blood pressure and dizz causes dizziness uh, when standing up. Uh, chronic hypotension uh, could be due to poor nutrition, lack of exercise. Um, nutrition, you know, you could treat this even with just consuming more salt. Um, salt will actually raise your, your blood pressure. Um, it could also be a warning sign of some other things like Addison's disease and hypothyroidism. Uh, acute hypotension, uh, that could occur during circulatory shock. Maybe someone's bleeding. If you lose blood, your blood pressure can drop uh, pretty quickly. Uh, hypertension, high blood pressure. It could be transient. Some people get high blood pressure during fevers. You're going to get it during exercise. Uh, you could get it during, you know, emotional crises. Um, what we're biggest, cons biggest concern is chronic uh, hypertension. Uh, that can be associated with, you know, cardiovascular disease and illness. And then, you know, obesity can, can be one of those uh, players as well. Let's look at blood pressure throughout the circuit. So what we're looking at here is the changes that occur with that blood pressure as you go through the systemic circuit. Uh, when we measure someone's blood pressure, we're doing it at an artery, all right, which is pretty similar to the aorta. So notice here at the, this, this x-axis, we're going from the aorta, arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, and then vena cava. And then really we're going right atrium. So right atrium would be right here. Right atrium is often zero, uh, especially when it's relaxed. So what generates the pressure is the left ventricle. All right, so we're going to get this high pressure, low pressure. So notice kind of the oscillation systemic, or I should say systolic pressure high, diastolic low. Um, as you go away from the ventricle, it's going to start to drop a little bit. So it doesn't drop significantly in the arteries. So that's why we can measure pressure in the artery and assume that it's pretty close to the ventricle. All right. As we go into arterioles, it starts to drop more. We still see a little fluctuation but when we get to the smaller arterioles and then into the capillaries, there's no longer that systolic diastolic change. So, for example, when we get into capillaries, we're just going to learn one number, all right, because there isn't a systolic and diastolic anymore. But notice the trend. You're always going somewhere where the pressure's lower. So, blood moves from high pressure to low pressure. So, the lowest pressure should be your right atrium. All right. As far as blood vessels, your lowest pressure is your vena cava. Your highest pressure is your aorta. So we've got the highest pressure in the aorta and arteries. Um, resting young adult, you know, this says 110 over 70 or 120 over 80. Um, when we get to the capillary, it's kind of the start of the capillary, it's down to about 30, 35, 33 millimeters mercury. When we leave a capillary, it's about 13, all right? So that's when we're going into the venules. And then when we get to the right atrium, it's zero, all right? So that's the trend we see uh, with blood pressure. Notice the center line is the mean blood pressure or mean arterial pressure or MAP. Um, this is the average pressure throughout a cycle. Uh, this, there's a calculation actually for this, so this is kind of the, one of the equations to calculate mean arterial pressure. Um, you take the diastolic pressure and you add that to one-third of what's called pulse pressure. Pulse pressure is just the difference between systolic and diastolic. So let's say you're that 120 over 80. You take 120 minus 80 is 40. You take one-third of that, or you divide it by 3 to get 13.3, and then you add the diastolic. So the, the average pressure in a cycle when someone has your 120 over 80 is 93.3 millimeters mercury. All right, uh, so that's called mean arterial pressure. Uh, velocity. So let's look at some graphs to help us understand the speed um, of blood. 
Uh, there's an important kind of rule here to remember that velocity or speed of blood is inversely related to cross-sectional area. So remember this diagram. Remember when we talked about an artery and it's going to divide and branch into smaller arteries and then eventually arterioles and then these would be the capillaries and then they start to merge together. Well notice that the area, if you were to be able to measure the area in here, this is a greater area than this, all right? Because there's just one artery here that has a certain area, but look at all the capillaries, all right? So cross-sectional area goes up in the capillaries. And if it's an inverse, that means wherever you have greater area, you're going to have a slower velocity, all right? So velocity is actually fastest in the aorta, so again, if we look down here, we're going aorta all the way eventually till we get to vena cava. The velocity is greatest in the aorta because it has the lowest cross-sectional area. Then as the cross-sectional area gets bigger, the velocity starts to slow. All right, so we start to slow down, and we're going to reach our slowest point in the capillaries. So the capillaries are where the blood slows down and that's important because that's going to give us time to do exchange. Right? So this should make sense, right? We're moving blood pretty quick because the goal is to get to the capillaries. Once we get to those capillaries we might want to slow down because we've got to do all that gas exchange, we got to exchange nutrients for waste, and it's much easier to do that when blood's moving slowly through a capillary than if that blood is flying through that capillary. Then, once we leave the capillaries, right, because these blood vessels start to merge together, the cross-sectional area goes down, and then the velocity starts to go up again. Um, now, it's never going to get as fast as the aorta, but notice the vena cava, the blood moves faster than in, a, than in the capillaries. All right, now... This is kind of a similar graph that we looked at prior. This is blood pressure. So don't, you know, confuse these two. Blood pressure consistently drops, whereas velocity drops and then goes back up on your venous or vein side. Okay? So this is blood velocity compared to blood pressure throughout your systemic circuit. All right, so blood pressure must decrease as it flows through the system. So blood pressure is, keeps dropping, velocity drops, and then starts to speed up again. Um, let's talk about resistance. So again, resistance was this idea that there's an opposition to blood flow. So when you're moving blood in one direction, there are things that oppose that blood flow. And if those Op opposing forces go up, then you have to raise blood pressure. All right. So the three main things that affect resistance are lumen diameter. So when the size of the blood vessel drops, the resistance goes up. All right. When blood viscosity goes up, so when blood get could get thicker, that increases resistance. And then when blood vessels are longer because of developing obesity, uh, that can increase resistance. So these are the things that can contribute to an increase in vascular resistance. And therefore, if you increase vascular resistance, blood pressure will have to rise. Because in order to continue to move that blood like you did before, uh, you got to overcome that increase in opposition or resistance, okay? So let's look at some of the things that affect the diameter, all right? So this is a, a pretty complicated figure. It's got a lot of things on it. Uh, I'm not going to hold you to all these things, but there are some important things that cause the blood vessel to either vasoconstrict or make the diameter smaller or vasodilate, make the diameter bigger. All right, now notice what this figure is trying to show down here. Anything that dilates the blood vessel is, is shown in green. All right, and we can call these things vasodilators. 
uh, the red arrow arrows mean it's something that constricts the blood vessel, and we call those vasoconstrictors. All right, so again, I'm not going to hold you to all these things, but we want to remember a few of the really important ones. So if we look at the green ones, I got two of them highlighted here. Nitric oxide is a molecule, all right, and it's known to be a pretty strong vasodilator. So you can give nitroglycerin, which produces nitric oxide as a vasodilator. Um, you can give other medications that'll increase nitric oxide and then cause vasodilation. One example actually is Viagra. Uh, Viagra is a drug to treat erectile dysfunction. Well, they found that that medication, which originally was developed for blood pressure treatment, um, targeted the penis a little bit more specifically and it dilates, it causes blood vessels in the penis to dilate, and that contributes to an erection, all right? Uh, the problem with Viagra and similar drugs is if the patient has any other medications that lower blood pressure, all right, so if the patient has hypertension and is on blood pressure medication, and then they take Viagra, you've got two drugs that lower blood pressure, uh, and they can have an extreme drop in blood pressure. Another one that vasodilates is a hormone. It's called atrial natriuretic peptide. Uh, we'll talk more about this going forward, but this is a hormone your body produces uh, that can lower your blood pressure. All right. The ones in red I want you to remember are sympathetic stimulation. All right. So when you have sympathetic activity, your blood pressure goes up. Right? So when you're exercising, when you're in an emergency situation, and one reason why your blood pressure goes up is the sympathetic neurons vasoconstrict your blood vessels. Uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, so they're going to do a similar thing as sympathetic um, nerves. Uh, sometimes they dilate, but we're not going to go there. I don't want you to get too confused. So sympathetic stimulation, epinephrine, there's another hormone called angiotensin II, is a vasoconstrictor, and then ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is also a vasoconstrictor. All right, uh, and then one other thing that constricts blood vessels is the buildup of atherosclerotic plaque. So this is what an artery would look like if someone has high cholesterol for many years and saturated fat buildup. Uh, in their arteries. So atherosclerosis is another one that makes the lumen size smaller and therefore will raise blood pressure. All right, so let's take a little break here. Uh, let that sink in a little bit. All right, so this is vasoconstriction, vasodilation. And then the next video, we're going to kind of switch gears and look at capillaries and how things. Uh, are exchanged between the blood and the tissue cells uh, at systemic capillaries.